Hello, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. I'm, um, I'm really happy to be here again at Milton Lab, and I really thank the organization for, for inviting me. Um, I'm working at One Right Time. One Right Time, we call ourselves a next generation venture capital platform. Um, basically, we dedicate ourselves to, to scout, to invest, and to, to really help startups, European tech startups, to, to be great, uh, great success. We do all that uh, thanks to technology, thanks to, to this platform model, and basically allowing our community investors to have the freedom, thanks to technology, to choose where they want to put the money. So we have been running for, I would say, almost a little bit more than three years. We have invested in alm almost 20 companies and uh, for more than 20 million, sorry, for more than 40 million. Um, having said that, I'm going to introduce the, the different panelists. First one is... Uh, Marta Pino is investment manager at Amadeus. Marta is an investment manager uh, on this uh, corporate investment program uh, that is investing in early stage startups, sitting at the crossroad between technology and travel. Before that, uh, Marta worked in M&A in leading marketplaces in Europe, like Scout24, Global Savings Group, and also in a venture capital uh, company in Portugal called Portugal Ventures. Please, big applause for, for Marta. Uh, secondly, uh, I'd like to, to invite to the stage Sebastián Fernández Medrano. He's principal at Samaipata. Sebastián is uh, in charge of all the investments in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. And uh, Samaipata is an European VC uh, with offices in uh, Madrid, London, Paris, investing in pre-series A marketplaces and platform across Europe. Again, thanks uh, for big applause for, for Sebastián. And last but not least, and also representing the, the, the entrepreneur and the, the, the startup domain, I'd like to, to invite as well Sébastien Marion. He's the founder and, and CEO at Casas.com. Uh, this is the real estate portal based in, uh, in Spain. Before launching Casas, uh, Sébastien was co-founder and CTO at a startup called Comify. Comify sorry. It was the world most scalable real-time CRM system. Indeed, in September 2014, Comufai was acquired by King. Uh, some of you may know that because it's a, it's a company present in the Barcelona ecosystem, in the gaming space. And as well, Sebastian is an angel investor and board member at Diego, which is a, also a, another famous um, startup that is present in Barcelona. Okay, last but not least, again, big applause for, for Sebastian for joining us. Okay, um, having done the introductions, uh, when, when we look at investment, if we look at in Europe, uh, as you can see in, in 2018, almost 25 billion euros have been invested in, in a startup. That's pretty much the same amount of uh, investment that was done in, in 2017. That's a lot of money, uh, I would say more money than ever. Uh, but even though we know that uh, fundraising is still a, a tough topic, a tough topic and a critical topic for the startup entrepreneurs that would, they would like to launch their, their company. So the idea of the panel today, uh, and the title is What do investors expect before fundraising your startup, is try to unpack a little bit all this uh, fundraising topic. Um, maybe before starting, and basically uh, we structure the panel around three topics. The first topic is when should a startup fundraise, after is why should a startup fundraise, and last but not least, how should a startup fundraise. I'd like maybe to understand a little bit the audience. Uh, how many of you uh, are you planning to fundraise, or if you are entrepreneurs, are you planning to fundraise in the, in the coming month? Maybe if you can raise your hand to know a little bit the number of people that we have entrepreneurs. Okay. And how many of you you have already fundraised? How many of you have already gone through that process? Okay, a little bit more, less than that. Okay, um, having said that, okay, let's set, let's move to first 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 area, which uh, I call it when should a startup fundraise. I think a lot of literature we have had uh, in the past regarding when should a startup uh, should be fundraising. Always a lot of people say cash is king. If you don't have 
if you don't have cash, you, can, you are not able to be able to run the company. Um, maybe at, at, on this first question, I would like our entrepreneur, Sebastian, a uh, quick question is, when did you know that you needed to fundraise, either on your current company or on your past company? What do what, what you think is the best moment and the best conditions, especially for the founding team, to be able to, to fundraise? And maybe from your experience, would you do it at the same time? Would you do it again uh, at that moment, or you would do it differently? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's a, it's a tough question. Uh, it's a tough question because it depends on many different factors. It depends on uh, what career you've had in the first place. It depends on uh, what uh, industry you're targeting. I mean, you know, if you're in AI, you might find you might have an easier time than you know, say, if you're in real estate. Um, also, depends on your geography. Uh, if you're in San Francisco, chances are it will be easier to raise than here in Spain. And so, uh, it depends on a lot of different factors. Um, and, and I think, um, so actually in my first startup, when we, uh, when we tried first to raise money, we failed. Uh, we spent, I think, uh, maybe eight months of our life doing just that, doing just try to raise money and we failed and, and we didn't raise a penny. And, and, and do you know what? Eight months is a long time. For a startup, it's a long time. And, and it's eight months that you're not spending growing your business. And so I think um, the first question you have to ask yourself is, do you really need that money? Because you know the investment will not come tomorrow, and so it will take months, many, many months, especially if it's your first time. And so you have to think, OK, but that month, how many customers could I have acquired if I had focused on that instead? And, and, and then you know, experience has showed me that, in fact, once you've got the customers, then the VCs come to you. Uh, whereas when you go chasing the VCs, you know, if you don't have traction, they typically reject you. And so, um, so, so I think that's the, the, the first question uh, you have to ask yourself. Do I really need that money? Um, and so different, uh, depending on your startup, you may or you may not. Uh, in my previous startup, we in fact managed to survive without it. We eventually raised a tiny bit, but, uh, and by the way, if you raise little, it means that when you exit, you'll make a lot more money. Because if you, if you sell a company for 10 million euros, but you have 90% of the equity, that's a very different thing from uh, selling a company at 100 million and you have 10% of the equity. More or less, you'll earn the same. But I'll tell you what, it's much easier to sell something at 10 million than, than at 100 million. So, so that's the other uh, thing to take into account. And so um, would I do it differently? I mean, one of the mistakes, in fact, I was uh, commenting to Sebastian earlier, uh, one of the mistakes that I did this time around, um, I, uh, because you know I'm a, I'm a second time uh, founder, and so of course that always makes it easier. But I think uh, one of the mistakes that I did is I uh, raised the, the, the bar too high in terms of what I expected for valuation, and it made the process slower. So we eventually raised about a million euros, but I think I could have done it in, in, you know, in a quarter of the time if I hadn't been uh, so greedy, I think, on the valuation. And so I think this is also one thing to consider as a startup. You know, um, it's important to protect your equity, but at the same time, depending on the market, you probably need to go very fast. Um, so this one I would have done differently, I think. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, now maybe you're more on the VC, uh, on the VC hat. Marta, uh, how do you figure out or wh what's your take when you see a startup to see if that the startup really needs to, to fundraise? It's just a matter of cash, as many people, and you know this famous sentence, cash is king. What, what would be your take on that one? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So first I would say that I or we are not that concerned when we go out and try to, to meet startups that they are, if they are fundraising. So I think it's really important to build relationships uh, with a startup and, and the other way around. So that even, for example, I, I was even talking with Sebastian before, most of the startups I, I meet or I have meetings with calls, they are quite at an earlier stage than what we invest. Nevertheless, I think it's important for us to, to establish that communication channel to know the startup, to be able to follow their development and growth and be there at the right time when they, when they fundraise, when the moment uh, uh, comes. And, and for the startup, I think it's also very important that they, that they build this relationship with investors, no? That they, um, that, that ba basically they, they are 
ha taking some steps that will accelerate the fundraising process when, when they get there. You know, they, they don't have to, when you start fundraising, you don't have to be thinking about who can I speak with at Amadeus or whoever is the, the, the investor. So I think it's a lot of building relationships for both for the investor and the startup so that uh, things are much easier and faster when, when the fundraising moment uh, comes. And, and if you think about that, the average, the statistics say that in average a startup fundraises every 12 to 18 months. So it's basically, it means that every year founders need to go through this, through this exercise. As, was, as, it, as Sebastian was mentioning, is quite time consuming and, and requires a lot of effort from the, and, and time from the team. Um, so basically what I would say next is, is that this needs to be properly planned and, and the time that it takes to fundraise needs to be taken into consideration um, so that the startup doesn't get to the point at, uh, that it's desperately needing the cash to be able to, to survive. So I think the time to fundraise would be earlier, obviously early, earlier than that. Um, so that's it, it's, it's building relationships, not focusing on the, on the, on the, is a startup fundraising or not. Um, and, and then when the time arrives, we will both be better prepared and ready to, to, to establish that relationship. Okay, thank you, Marta. And last but not least, Sebastian. Um, on the same topic, maybe my question for you is, what are the key indicators at Samaipata, uh, especially you are really uh, targeting uh, you know, the marketplace on the platform domain, what would be the key indicators for you that it arrived at the right time to fundraise for a startup? Uh, we discussed as well a little bit before on the backstage, similar to what Marta said, you know, that you follow the startups long before they do the fundraising. No? So uh, maybe my point would be, when you figure out that the startup at that point is ready to do the fundraise, is ready for you as an investor, because at the end of the day, investors, we, we make our life, uh, our business is really to make good investments and to give the money back to our LPs, to the people that give us the money. So wh what are the key indicators for you on the marketplace domain to say, okay, that the startup is ready to fundraise to go up and meet investors? Uh, so, yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, disclaimer, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm a cohort, a fixed employee. So uh, I don't feel very legitimate like to judge uh, businesses or like to uh, say an opinion as if I was a guru. But it's always a pleasure to share patterns and to continue learning from the brave people like, like Sebastian. Um, for me, what I, so I don't think there are specific indicators on, on marketplaces other than as you're building supply and demand, if, if you build supply and demand simultaneously, uh, you do need to understand very well how to acquire both sides of, of a platform. But what I wanted to say, what I think for me is a key indicator of, of the moment to fundraise is um, the fact that during the, thir the three, four first years of a company, of the lifetime of a company, I think that period represents an amazing time to learn uh, as an entrepreneur. And maybe, I don't know if you will agree with me or not, but especially at least on the first one, two years, you have a great opportunity to uh, probably spend more time learning, make more mistakes, and have a bit less of a pressure uh, on the need of grow uh, at a massive speed uh, constantly. So at Samaipata, we like to say that uh, when, when we see businesses that are started, starting to fundraise, we prefer to meet founders that instead of growing, have been learning how to grow. Because uh, we come across a lot of businesses that show super healthy like growth dynamics, but when you dig a bit and you start speaking with them to understand, hey, what's, what's the growth strategy of, of your business, they don't have a clue. And when you face founders that have spent time understanding which are the right acquisition channels, which are the conversion rates for each acquisition channel, and essentially having some predictability on, for every euro I, like say drop on top of a funnel, I have some sort of predictability on what's gonna happen with that euro in terms of acquisition of clients. Um, that shows uh, that you're ready to inject a significant amount of capital to scale, scale your business. So uh, the, the best indicator for me, it's uh, the learning ability. So it's meeting a founder that shows, uh, of course you need to learn fast uh, because uh, market keeps moving and, and you need to grow, but that shows that when he or she has faced uh, challenge, 
because an acquisition channel is saturating, because they, he, he or she cannot find a way to properly acquire users on a specific channel, instead of running away of that problem and just looking for another random channel to continue growing, they face the issue and they've understood what was going on and why they weren't being able to, to continue like scaling uh, through that specific measure. So we meet founders very early. We try to meet them even on the first weeks of, of the lifetime of their businesses, even when they haven't incorporated yet. And we start building like a trust a relationship over time to try to see if they're, if they're good at learning, if they're of course good at executing, but good about understanding how, how to grow the business properly. So best indicator is to have a playbook, at least a draft of a playbook of how do you wanna scale your business uh, once you have the money to properly inject in acquisition. And then of course, in this set, we always recommend founders to fundraise at least with six months runway because uh, it takes time to fundraise, as, as Seb was saying. And especially, and even if, even more, if the markets where you're operating are challenging or the, your business model is hard to understand because many times business models are hard to pitch to investors and it takes time for them to understand it. And as my assumption is that you need to speak to a huge amount of investors to get to a term sheet because conversion is super low, uh, both for the time it will take you to speak to a lot of people, but also for the time it will take for the people to understand your business, you need to have a sufficient like, uh, yeah, range of time. Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, no, I mean, I, I completely agree. And, and I just want to add another point because you are talking about um, making sure that you've tried different things and, and, and make sure you understand what are the growth uh, sort of aspects. Uh, one, one of the things that we did here at, at Casas is the first six months before even launching the business, the only thing that I did was talking to people. I, I basically talked to so many investors and entrepreneurs and, and, and people in the industry and, and just, you know, I, I put my idea across to them and, and I was just looking for feedback and learning. And I iterated on the business again and again and again and again. And, and those six months probably saved us years of, 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 of lifetime because if you've got to learn that while doing it, it takes a lot longer and a lot more money. So um, yeah, as much as you can learn sort of for free like this before launching your business, if, if you haven't launched it yet, uh, I think it's very, very useful. Okay, yeah, useful comment. And yes, please uh, as well for Martha, don't hesitate if you want to react on some of the comment from Sebastiano, from the two Sebastians, let's call it that way. Um, okay, um, on, on that we cover, or we try to cover a little bit on, on the when. I, I would like to, to go more on the why. And I remember, I think it was a couple of years ago, in a similar panel, we had a big discussion with a famous entrepreneur in Barcelona, French one, saying that VCs, the only thing they, they put on the table is money, and that's it. Uh, entrepreneurs, they, uh, they don't need anything else than that, and VCs, they don't afford anything else than that. No? Mm, I'd like to go a little bit deep, a little bit on that. Uh, we have all seen this mega round from soft banks on the, those big players. And maybe my question, I'm um, coming back to Sebastian, is when you are looking on, I mean, besides putting the money on the table, what, what do you think is the role of, of a VC, venture capital? Uh, I would say on your case that you are not linked to any, you know, to any corporate. What's your, what you should put on the table besides money, no? And that, that I think it's an important thing, at least in, on my had as, as VC, I think we should be able to provide something else. And my question would be, what do you think is the role of a VC besides putting on the table the money they need that the startup to survive, the king to pay salaries, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, so yeah, that's it's a super interesting question. So historically, like I think the venture capital business has been perceived as the buy side. So as we were the ones putting the money, the decision uh, or the bargaining power, the decision was on our, on our side. The way we understand venture capital at Samaipata, it's uh, as, as the sell side. So it is our role to convince you to allow us to invest in your business. So for that, um, I think you need to understand always the due diligence with an investor as a bidirectional process, where we're doing due diligence on the founders, but you need to do due diligence on us. And if you don't set that tone at the very beginning when you start meeting the investor, the relationship between the investor and the founder will not be democrat that democratic or that horizontal. You need to make sure from the very beginning that you face, uh, you, you expect the investors to answer every single question you have about the process. And for that first, I would say uh, you should expect from investors during the due diligence process uh, to be transparent about 
the processes, the timings, and how will they work with you after investing, which is key. Um, you need to uh, expect from them to share with you some objective data points on why will they be helpful after investment, because there's a lot of selling uh, from the VC side on what we do that is very qualitative, uh, as in like, we're the coolest VC, we're the coolest investor, we're gonna help you with this and that, but okay, but what's the objective data of your performance as a firm? And I think some objective data points for you to ask in case they're helpful are uh, money that has been raised by their portfolio after the firm, the VC firm you're talking to invested, and in the cases where the VC firm was a lead investor. Because if you're a follower investor and you've put a small ticket, normally you don't have that much of an impact on the company on a daily basis, and thus that much of an impact on the money they fund, the portfolio has fundraised. Also, from, from who did has the portfolio raised after them? Is it from prestigious investors with a track record of value-adding uh, investing or not? And of course, for example, having access to the portfolio CEOs uh, to have a direct opinion from them. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's, speaking about some iPad, uh, what makes us sort of different? Uh, it's, it's obviously a, a great opportunity for self-promotion. Uh, but we are, uh, versus the majority of the VCs that are normally local and agnostic, meaning that they invest normally only in the city or in the country where they're based, in all sorts of business models and stages. We are pan-European and thematic, so we invest across Europe, but exclusively on a business model and on a stage, which is a pre-seed and seed uh, marketplaces. Uh, so specialization allows you to gather a lot of experience, because essentially, if you've invested in a series of businesses before with the same business model, you come across exactly the same challenges all the time. So we've gone through those problems before. Um, then we have people on the ground, so if, uh, if, if, you have, if your investor has a person on the city where you live in or where you operate the business, it's always nice because uh, probably you have a more frequent interaction. And then uh, I think uh, the way we see VC is that it's, it's very different to face, with all my respects to the corporate VC, but it's, it's, almost, it's very different to face and, uh, founders' funds, so entrepreneur-driven funds, let's say funds driven by entrepreneurs that have exited their business and have started like investing, to uh, let's say executive, corporate, or financial, uh, financial people-driven VCs, as in in terms of uh, empathy. So basically, understanding the struggle of an entrepreneur, uh, and also in terms of how operational your approach to portfolio management is versus only purely financial, uh, makes a difference. So we are founders fund too, and that I think you should be expecting, especially in the first years of your business, a lot of operational support and em em empathetic. Uh, support uh, from your lead investor. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. I think we have a really young entrepreneur somewhere in, in, in the room. Huh? Um, <laughs> um, okay, maybe taking a little bit on one point you said, Sebas uh, Sebastian. Uh, Marta, on your case, as a, as a more uh, on the corporate side, as a corporate VC, what would be, what's in addition, on top of maybe some of the points that Sebastian already mentioned, that some iPad is putting on the table as a VC, what would be your, let's call it your added value as a corporate, what do you, you bring on top of that that could be useful as well for, for some, uh, you know, for some fundraising rounds that you can have a mix of different type of VCs, what would be different on, on the case of a corporate? Yeah, so maybe starting um, by the beginning, we are a um, startup investment program of a big corporate company, so Amadeus, Travel Tech, and Basically, we, we look to invest in startups that have um, developed solutions with application to the travel industry. So we have this particular focus as a corporate investor. And, and as a corporate investor as well, we, we obviously look uh, for financial return, but we also put a strong focus on strategic return. Um, so we're not the classic, as a corporate investor, we're definitely not the classic financial VC. And, and if we expect to be able to generate the strategic value with our investors, this can't come only by putting the money there, no? So it's, that's why we, we look for companies where we see that there is a strategic alignment with what Amadeus, um, how Amadeus sees the travel industry, and, 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 and what we are doing. And, and the strategic value can only come by 
doing something together with with a startup and and I think there's obviously where this added value on top of money comes uh, um, to the startup so how we do this first we 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 work with several players in the travel industry, you know, airlines, airports, hotels, uh, rail, etc. So we want to invest in a company um, where we see the potential to generate synergies, to, to work together, being by integrating their solution in our solution and go together to the customers or showcase their, their products that are complementary to, to what we have. Um, so this, this involves a lot of work, not directly with the ventures team, but with the internal business units at Amadeus, being if you, if you have a solution for hotels, then you will be working with the hospitality business unit, no, the expert, uh, internal experts on the topic, and, and approach customers, uh, customers together. So I would say that this is the main advantage that, um, that entrepreneurs see um, when, when, when they approach us or when they are speaking with us. Then on top of that, we, we do several customer customer events uh, yearly, um, where we, we we invite our portfolio companies, and I think that's also a good opportunity for them to to get access to to very senior um, targeted executives of of their uh, customer customer segment. Then again, uh, we are in the travel industry for 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 several decades and in a leading position and, and and so we have many people or all of our people think about travel every day so the opportunity for the startup to to get exposure to to, to this for example to, to this even to other uh, verticals in the travel industry that don't touch directly what they are doing and and to be able to 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 get no uh, 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 what they can get from the discussions um, are, is also something that they see is quite quite valuable. So I would say that uh, uh, we knowing that a corporate, not a Medeos, but a, a typical corporate investor that looks at not only at financial return but strategic return as well, you know that they will to be able to generate a strategic return, they need to do something with the startup. No, it's it's it's. I think it's it's. The, the interests are aligned. Uh, the startup wants to extract as more as possible from the, from the investor, from the corporate, uh, on top of the money, and and we want to do that as well, so that in our own benefit as well. No, so I think uh, this is definitely what I can say of, of as a strategic um, investor, corporate investor, what we can what we can add on top of of money. Okay, yeah. thank you, Martin. Make a lot of sense to me as a VC. Uh, what Sebastian and you said. Let's move that question to Sebastian, let's see what, what, uh, what he thinks. Um, same, same question, what, what do you think VCs both, I would say, classy, I mean, not corporate related, the corporate ones and maybe others, what, what do you think, or what you are looking for while you are fundraising, only money, what do you, or what do you expect from them uh, in terms of maybe, I don't know, talent management, um, business development, you know, helping them in future fundraisings, what, I mean, what were you looking for on the different fundraisings you have done? Did you achieve to find something? And what's your take maybe on this, you know, found question on the fundraisings and VCs? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, ev every investor is different. Um, and so uh, I think if you have an investor that's not adding value, then that's a shame. That's not the worst thing because some are taking value away. So that could be worse, right? Um, but, 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 but some investors are certainly uh, very, very useful. Uh, and, and, and they all sort of have uh, different ways of helping you out. I mean, uh, some of them actually have sort of in-house teams of HR recruiters, whatever, that, that you can tap on. And you know, that's very useful. Um, others have a, perhaps a more developed network of, uh, of investors, perhaps for the follow-on round. Some, uh, some, in fact, do go, uh, do do follow-ups. Um, and, and so they, they all have sort of different specialty, and I think you need to analyze what's, what's, uh, what's right for you. Um, I think in our case here, um, so for our, uh, for our first round, we've been very fortunate because, uh, but that was, um, that was, that was st strategical, right? So, so we only took on board um, entrepreneurs that had done it before. 
Um, and so it means that, you know, basically we have, you know, uh, some, some 15 investors that have all exited their business before. And what this means for me is that whenever I've got questions or, 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 I've got, or, or, or a struggle perhaps or, or somebody made me an offer, whatever, I can pick up the phone and I can talk to them and, you know, they'll give me their, 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 their advice from an entrepreneur's perspective and that's extremely valuable. Um, of course, I can also use their network when I need. Um, and so that's very, very valuable. So, um, um, so yeah, it depends on your investors, but I think a good investor should be able to add value more than just the money. Happy to hear and th thank you for the for that answer. That I think uh, it's something important. I think uh, as investors too that you figure out that, that there's something else than just money. No? Um, okay, with, with that, uh, I hope we try to cover a little bit those two first questions: when and why. The last one would be how. I think you already, the three of you, you already give some some tips uh, on, on how maybe I, I would like to in this case to ask again Sebastian as you are an entrepreneur with a, you know some experience on that um, how do you decide to, to you know you mentioned before that you you had six months talking with people maybe maybe some you know fundraising tips on how you when you decided to fundraise what would be your advice to, to these people that they were thinking uh, to, to fundraise in the coming month as entrepreneurs maybe some you know some some tips that you would really recommend to them yeah i mean um okay there, there, there's two things there's f there, there's getting your first investors and then there's getting the other ones and i think uh, the strategy can be a bit different um and so for for getting your uh, your first investor um you're gonna have to sell a dream right you you, you need to uh, make them understand and feel why you're doing this why is this really important to you and why is this going to impact people and then why would people pay you for, for fixing that, right? And how, obviously how big is your market, and then you need to really understand your number and your market. Um, I, I think in the end, um, the thing about selling is, you know, th there's a lot of people in this room who, who would probably say, you know, I'm not, I'm not a salesman, you know, I'm very bad at it. Um, and I was uh, recently listening to the um, Shoe Dog, it's the, it's the book by the founder of Nike. Um, and, and, you know, he, he said himself, you know, he's a very bad salesman. But when he talks about his shoes, he becomes so passionate about it that he can sell it to anyone. And, and I think this is what it's about, you know, you, you may not be a good salesman, maybe, um, but if you are really passionate about what you're doing, I think, I think eventually it comes across. Um, and and so, so that's obviously, I think, the, the first point. And, and make sure that, uh, you know, you, you have the, the, the right team, you understand your product, all these things are sort of the, the, the more obvious ones. Um, and I think to getting your, your next uh, investors, uh, one thing that worked really, really well for me in this fundraising is whenever I got an investor, I told them, okay, well, who else do you know? Who else do you know that could be interested in this? You know, help me out. Um, and then, you know, they start forwarding emails and, you know, contacting some people that they know. And of course, when an investor has already invested in something and he's recommended it, recommending it to his peers, it's much easier for the peers to say yes. Um, so, so this is definitely uh, a good strategy, like jump from investor to investor, get their network to, to recommend them for you. Um, and then the last thing, especially if it's your first round, um, is like use a convertible note, right? Um, it, it is kind of obvious these days, not always maybe, um, but it makes your life so much easier. So what this means is, Whenever you have an investor that's ready to sign, you make them sign, you get the money right now, and then you move on to the next one. It means that your company can keep operating, and you know you can raise over a long period of time. Um, when it gets to later rounds, it's in fact much more tricky because you have to then align your investors. So you have to say, well, you know, we'll be closing the round in June, whatever. Um, but but it's it's much more tricky because if the if the round gets extended, then then you know you have a deadline problem and. And, and aligning, you know, six, seven investors is really, really hard. So, um, so especially on your first round, make sure you use convertible note because that's very helpful. Okay, Th thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I think very useful tips. Um, maybe as we have uh, uh, Marta from, from corporate, maybe I would like to ask you if some of uh, those entrepreneurs they would like to, to have or between the you know the different investors a corporate one what would be different maybe or what do you expect from them compared to other VCs I mean when you see those entrepreneurs approaching you what if and especially if they want you know a corporate one to be on their 
cap table, what, what would be your advice to them? What you are expecting from them when they approach, uh, you know, a kind of a corporate VC or start a program from a, a corporate? So I think that one of the things that Sebastian mentioned, I think, in the first question was, was on the, the due diligence, no? That it should be mutual. Uh, we, we should be doing due diligence on the startups and, and the other way around. And I think that if you looking thinking about Amadeus or other strategic investor that you know beforehand that they will um, that they have a strong focus on strategic return, um, what I would expect is that the startup, when pitching to a strategic investor, um, adjusts the pitch accordingly. Meaning you have you have the pitch that you you basically uh, uh, using with, with financial investors, but when you reach out to a strategic investor and you know that there is a focus on strategic return, think about beforehand, what are the collaboration opportunities that you see with a corporate investor? Because I would assume that's one of the main reasons for you to reach out to a corporate investor. So think about that and make that part of your pitch. You know? Help us understand how we can work together because if, if this is an important factor, um, then you better put it in, on the pitch and, 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 and use that in your favor, no? And, and prepare and, um, and, and be ready to help us understand why we could be a good fit and we could, uh, we could work together on top of the, of the investment. I think it's, it's prepare, know your, know, know your future investor or potential investor and, and adjust the pitch accordingly. I think that's, that's especially important for um, strategic investors that look for this collaboration um, component. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Marta. I think that, that's an important point. Maybe uh, I'll ask maybe a last intervention from our panelists before we open uh, maybe five, 10 minutes in terms of q and I, I think that, that's useful. Maybe Sebastian, uh, I don't know, I'd like if you want to share maybe some you know, experience histories on uh, what's your you know, golden rule to be able to attract those entrepreneurs, what worked for you, what didn't work, or if you want to share, I don't know, uh, you know, what is no-no on your side, yes, I mean, maybe some final tips on that uh, before we, we open the Q&A, uh, really, uh, please. Yeah. Um, so, essentially, uh, all this process is like getting married, right? So, uh, you, you have like some weeks to get to meet someone you're going to get in bed with, so you better spend a lot of time uh, speaking uh, on WhatsApp, in person. Uh, you, you need to really meet who, who are you going to be working with for years. Um, so what, what we try to do to demonstrate entrepreneurs uh, that we're a good travel companion is, of course, allow for, for a lot of time uh, for questions to ask. Uh, make sure you speak with all uh, the members of our team. And yeah, and we do like an onboarding day so that you understand fully what we do in Samaipata with you, how do we work with you, and, and yeah. So it's basically a lot about time and, and friction in the good, in the good sense, uh, spending time together. Um, I don't have, a, so I think I've never said no to a founder straight away, uh, even though I've met a, a, a bunch of arrogance and, and rude people uh, across these last four years. Um, but, and, and I've always, I mean, what I expect to hear from founders is uh, who they are, what their vision is, why, what's their, their personal link to what they are doing, why, are they, why have they become entrepreneurs, and why, what's their personal link to this industry, if they understand the market they are operating in, and why is it the right moment now to launch a model like theirs, because sometimes the model like, looks cool, but nothing has changed in the industry, or there aren't incentives in the value chain for you to start a business in this market at this point. Um, and things like that could, in a way, uh, generate a red flag at the very beginning of the conversation. Uh, could be, um, so I don't like to see founders that are exit driven in general. Uh, I don't like to see founders that are driven by the opportunity to sell, but that are driven by the opportunity to build a big story and, and uh, by, to follow their vision. I don't like to see founders that are executing the vision from day one. Uh, I always uh, try to do this difference between the vision and the go-to-market strategy. So Uber was born in San Francisco as a luxurious limousine service for executives. That was a go-to-market strategy. It was like a Troy horse to penetrate the market. But the vision was to become a 
logistics company, moving people, cargo, food, uh, whatever, right? So, and I come across a lot of founders that try to execute the vision from day one. It's different uh, the destination than the path you need to follow to, to reach it. Um, I don't like to see founders speaking bad about competitors, that I hate it. Uh, I, I, I hate to see entrepreneurs, instead of admiring others and trying to learn from others, just criticizing or uh, avoiding, yeah, avoiding the ability to learn from what others are doing better than you. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's selfish, I think it's bad for the ecosystem. And I don't like to see a very complex uh, cap table structures or governance structures. Uh, so founders super diluted uh, from scratch uh, or let's say in the end, your cap table is the governing body of the company. Uh, so, and we enter at a super early stage. If at the moment we enter, it's already a, a hard structure to manage, uh, it's a problem, right? So we, we spend a lot of time for, for, uh, with founders to create this, this bond, this link. And what we expect to do during those interactions is to prove you that we are good at providing you input for better decision making, because that's what we do. In the end, founders are on a daily basis focused on their business, and they don't have that much time to have like sort of an helicopter vision on, I don't know if you agree, on where is this heading, right? They need to be like on the mine, and, and our role as investors is to challenge you, uh, qu qu make you question the business, and, and yeah, give you some relief uh, trying to escape the the toughness of of the daily operations to understand how is my organization growing and that sort of uh, interaction in the interactions we have with you while meeting you we try to prove you that we try the, to prove you that we're good at helping you make better decisions but we are a travel companion we're not a we're not the driver of the car we're just a co-pilot uh, trying to yeah give you some input for you to take it into consideration of course yeah um, no, sorry. Actually, I, I, I w so I want to comment on that. Um, in fact, recently, well, sort of uh, last year, I, one of uh, the investors that I was pitching eventually turned me down. Uh, he turned me down and he told me, you know, Seb, I'm not convinced about it. I will never invest. Um, but, you know, we were, like, very friendly. Like, he was a really good guy. And uh, so I reached out to him three months ago and I was like, you know, I remember you told me you'll never invest. And, 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 and I want to actually take this opportunity for you to be my coach. Right, because he was actually uh, an entrepreneur with success as well. And so, uh, so now regularly I actually meet him over lunch and, and he coaches me and he gives me, you know, very uh, honest feedback because there is no, like, I'm not hiding anything because anyway, I know he won't invest, or, you know. Um, and, and, and I find that, in fact, very, very useful uh, because it does give you that helicopter view that perhaps sometimes you don't have as a founder, uh, especially a first-time founder, it's very hard. Uh, you sort of, like, uh, get into your thing and, and sometimes it's hard to um, sort of... Uh, yeah, get get that higher view and be a bit more pragmatic. Exactly. So uh, yeah, that that that's a cool trick as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, um, we're just pivoting a little bit on the order, but uh, as you already speak, maybe Sebastian, if you want to add maybe something else, final maybe tips on how you think a startup can stand out, because you know there are a lot of startups trying to fundraise. What besides what you just said that uh, I think you know how you can transform a no in a winning position, not to help you. On the, on the future as coaching on, on that investor because at the end of the day, you know, I think that's useful that every conversation, every meeting, you always take out something out of it, no? Uh, even if it's not exactly what you were looking for. Maybe I would say what are your tips or something you want maybe to, to highlight on, you know, as an entrepreneur? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I, I've said, uh, I'm probably going to repeat myself, but I think one, Make sure, you, make sure you're, you're selling a dream. Well, actually, hang on. First, make sure you understand why you need the money, because maybe you don't, right? So, 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 so that's, that, that's the first one. Um, second is, yeah, sell, sell a dream, sell something you're really passionate about. And the third thing is know, know your numbers, know your market, know, know, know your story inside out. Um, because, you know, oh, and, and, and by the way, be honest, be honest. You have to be honest with investors. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it's tempting some hi some, sometimes to, to hide... Um, maybe some metrics that are not favorable or, or, or some uh, sort of fears that you have. But believe me, investors will find out. Like you cannot, you know, you cannot, you cannot hide those things. And so, um, so be honest from, the, from day one because in fact, uh, investors appreciate that. Um, so yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Maybe last but not least, Marta, uh, if you want to add maybe something, uh, I don't know, maybe what was maybe for you the startup that was easiest to say yes? Maybe a success story, do you, you, you have something you say yes, that's, uh, you know, I go for it. 
or if you want to add something else, uh, please feel free, yeah. So on, on an example of a startup, I, I think I would pick up the recent one, our recent investment. I think it's, it's a good, I, I wouldn't call it exactly the, the easier one uh, from our experience, but it's, it's the latest one and it's a good example. So it's a company called Refunded. Um, they basically developed a mobile solution to reclaim um, VAT, um, VAT uh, that it's a very, as you might know, very it's paperwork, it's, you, have, you see lo this long queues at the airports, so it's definitely a pain point, no? It's not a very um, pleasant um, experience. So they basically developed a solution to digitalize this. And, uh, and why would I say that this is uh, example, a good example of a yes? It's because it ticks a lot of, of boxes, no? That we, as an investor, as a strategic investor, we, we look for. Um, first of all, uh, the founders team. They are both um, serial entrepreneurs. Uh, one of them, uh, Uri, was the, one of the co-founders of Waze. Um, and, and the other, Sif, uh, was the co-founder of, of a successful biotech company. Uh, and that's definitely something, so this track record, no? This is something that is, 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 uh, gives confidence to, to, to investors that they will be able to execute, to execute the plan, the strategy. Then, uh, they are basically addressing a very big market uh, and, and that is ripe for, for disruption, no? And uh, just an ex as an example, um, in Europe, 90% uh, um, of the VAT are actually not uh, uh, claimed every year. So that's a lot of potential, lots of potential here. And then the third, um, as a strategic investor in the travel space, they are actually addressing a very significant pain point, not only for the traveler, but for airports as well. No, this is not pleasant uh, to, 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 to anyone. And, and this is how at Amadeus, we, we want to position ourselves and, 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 and see the future of travel to address these pain points across the, the travel, the travel um, journey. And so I think this is definitely a very recent one. So <laughs> to share and, 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 and that I would like to, to, to share with you, yeah. Okay. Then, thank you, Marta. Uh, I think we're running a little bit late. Maybe we can take two, three questions. I don't know, Matt, yeah? Two, okay. Um, I think we have a hand over there. I don't know if you... Thank you. Uh, this is Alejandro. Uh, I'm from Surmile. Uh, we are raising money. And uh, there are like two questions. First one is, why do VCs normally don't say no? Even if it's an, a clearly no, but sometimes why maybe in the future, no? They normally avoid the no word in my, in my case. And the second is, uh, is it a good uh, idea to go and search to international VCs, even in a pre seed stage? Thank you. So, um, speaking about my experience about the no's, we, we say no's. Uh, I would say that most of the times um, it's not a no, it's a not now, um, because if we see potential, but be either because the timing is not the right one or because the, the moment on our side is not the right one. No, as a strategic investor, we don't see, we don't see what you're, the, sol the problem you're addressing or the solution you're bringing as a, as a priority. Then we, but, but for us, for our internal, no, considering our internal uh, strategy, then we could invest, but we would become financial investors because we would not have the, 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 the internal resources dedicated to work with the, with the startup. Um, so from my point of view, um, we say no. So uh, when we don't say no is because we, we want to keep, keep in touch with you because we think what you're doing is interesting and, and we want to be able to uh, eventually consider the investment opportunity in the future. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you spoke to us historically, but if you did and, and we didn't respond, uh, I'm sorry. So first, I apologize. Uh, and I, we say a lot of no. I, I do it all the times because uh, for us, transparency and, and timings with entrepreneur, it's what drives our, let's say, commercial due diligence process. Because uh, my boss, it's an entrepreneur. He launched a company called La Nevera Roja. And he suffered a lot of, of this, of uh, waiting, uh, of not getting the proper answer, not getting sincerity. So we've been like disciplined to, to answer uh, always. Uh, and I try to do it on the same call. So by the end of the call, first of all, if you are not in the countries where we invest, or you are not a marketplace, or you are not at the stage where we invest, it's out because it's out of the thesis. And if you're within those three criteria, uh, we will need to give you a reasonable answer. And, and I can show you the kind of emails we share with entrepreneurs, but it's always at least a couple of paragraphs uh, where we, in detail, give a reason. We might be wrong, but we are obsessed with uh, giving rigorous answers to behind the nose. And it, uh, following what Marta say, and, and I fully agree with, with her, what happens many times is that you want to meet the entrepreneur early in time to build a, uh, a trustworthy and genuine relationship so that when the moment you raise a round with a seed investor, like in our case, we invest on average a million every time we enter in a company. Um, so when you want to raise the first institutional round, we will have built uh, that relationship over the, the months we've been in touch. Uh, and during those months, we hope we, ha we have been able to provide you the value to demonstrate you that we are the right uh, travel companion. But to your point, I don't want to like escape uh, the matter. You're right. It happens in the industry. It's a problem. Uh, not getting an email reply is super rude. And, and not getting a straightforward uh, decision is super rude. So if that has happened to you with us or if it has happened uh, you with, to other, uh, with other of my colleagues, uh, please accept uh, my apologies. On the international investors, for sure, 100%, uh, go for it. It's something I tell to Spanish entrepreneurs always. Uh, speak to every single VC worldwide. Try to narrow the focus to the ones that potentially invest in your country, because some are like super like clear with with the geographical footprint. But go for it for sure. You need to build a funnel and be ambitious enough to fundraise from whoever in the world wants to invest in your business. Yep, uh, Arkady talking from Party Play Music. Uh, Thanks for all, thanks for coming and trying to help us with the fundraising challenge. We appreciate it. Uh, I have a question to Sebastian Fernandez. Uh, it's not that clear in what industry uh, Samayapad is investing. Mm, can you explain it in more details and tell us what you think about investing in music tech? Uh, so we are industry agnostic uh, so we invest exclusively on marketplaces but regardless of the industry we've done uh, job marketplaces fashion marketplaces food marketplaces flower marketplaces transportation marketplaces uh, so regardless of the industry we invest in platforms that aggregate supply and demand some way somehow where supply and demand have many on both sides so we're connecting many to many and we invest on on that tech layer which can be called marketplace but it's like a broader concept that intermediates between supply and demand and provides with some sort of matching component or exchange component between those, those two sides. We like to see businesses uh, with defensibility base uh, built upon network effects. So businesses where additional units from both the supply and the demand uh, provide additional value to the whole platform experience. But we can invest in any industry. So if you are building a platform related to the music industry, it's completely within our thesis. OK. Thank you, Sebastian. I think we, we have to stop here. Thanks a lot to the panelists. Really helpful, all, all, all your comments, and uh, as well, thanks you to, to the audience for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.